Friends, if I could just have your attention. I'd like to say welcome uh, to St. John's. My name is Sari. I'm the rector here. If you're not familiar with that terminology, it's like the senior pastor. We're still using antiquated terms, rector. Um, don't ask me to tell you what it means. I'm not really sure. Um, but uh, this is St. John's. This is our parish hall. Um, and just a quick reference, if you want to know where the restrooms are, there's one right outside this door, and there's um, uh, restrooms down the hallway all the way there. So um, just in case. Um, I wanted to just begin today by um, just saying how important these kinds of dialogues are. Uh, I am uh, a new, um, I'm, I'm new to JIDS, so I uh, have learned a lot about uh, JIDS recently, and Anne is going to introduce um, our speakers in a second and say a little bit more about uh, JIDS. But I did want to say that, especially in light of what's happening in Israel-Palestine right now, we can't have enough of this kind of stuff. Uh, and I was just speaking to my friend, Mike, where's Mike up here. And he said, when the dialogue stops, there's nowhere else to go. And so, um, even if the dialogue is painful, sometimes we have to stay committed to that path because there's, that's the only way forward. So, um, just a quick thing. I am a Palestinian, a Palestinian Christian. And, um, and so, uh, just even from that standpoint, not just from my faith standpoint, but from the standpoint of my uh, culture, I just want to say thank you all for being here. Uh, it's amazing. So let me turn it over to Anne. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to St. John's. My name is Anne Dursey, and I'm the deacon here at St. John's. That's another antiquated term, but it means the person who oversees the social justice, interfaith, community engagement, humanitarian work of the church. And I too thank you for coming here today because I'm a huge proponent of JIDS. I've had the pleasure of attending a number of different JIDS events and the principles of JIDS that we have dialogue, when we have dialogue, that's the foundation for everything else and civil dialogue where we can really hear and understand other people. These are principles that we uphold here at St. John's. And at the several events I attended that JIDS has hosted, I have just been astonished at the depth of the conversation and at the respect with which people can disagree and learn from one another and really understand each other. It's just a remarkable uh, organization. So I was very happy when Dan Spiro, who, as you all know, uh, is behind this fabulous organization, uh, agreed to come in a, and partner with us today. So we have this wonderful discussion amongst Jews, Muslims, and Christians about the importance of our holy books. And I'm going to stop there and just turn it over to Dan to fill us in a little bit. And Dan, there are several people here from our church who may not know a lot about the background of JIDS. And if you could say a word or two on that, that would be great. But again, let me thank you. And here, here's Dan. Well, I want to first of all thank all of you at the church um, for making this happen. Um, you know, our partnership with the Christian community is very important. We've had a, an entire session devoted to the Christian Bible. And um, I, for one, look forward to learning more and more about Christianity here today and for the rest of my life and feel that way about all the faiths. Um, but there's obviously a special connection between Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Um, the families, as we call them, of Abraham, Ibrahim. It is a family. Um, so a little bit about JIDS. We don't normally like to talk about ourselves, but we were asked. Um, this is, organization has been around for uh, almost 16 years. It was started at a time when a certain uh, president came uh, to the White House, Barack Obama, and um, everybody was very excited about the prospects for Middle East peace. And working for peace has been an important part of JIDS's mission from, from that point forward. Um, I have found working with peace organizations in this area that those people who are involved in JIDS may be just as obnoxious as those who aren't, but the difference is we stick. We stay with a dialogue. So people might argue with you, but we don't leave. Because um, dialogue is difficult, and this is a dialogue society. Um, we take on all the difficult topics. We've probably talked about the war maybe five times since October 7th. We have another one coming up that we're participating in on October, I mean, excuse me, September 15th. 
hopefully there'll be a ceasefire soon and not another. But anyway, um, but no, we're we're interested in long-term solutions, <laughs> um, which starts with, as as was pointed out by the Reverend, it starts with, you know, people getting to know each other, and you know, becoming brothers and sisters, and as the term we use in JIDs is first cousins and recognizing what it means to be a first cousin. You you argue in your family, right? But you stick with the family. So um, JIDS is also an enlightenment society, an education society. The idea is that we have a lot to learn from our cousins. Hopefully today, we will learn a lot from each other. I wanna point out that we have a picnic on the Sunday of Labor Day weekend. Um, we've been doing this for the last few years. Uh, there's literature here at the table talking about JIDS, but there's also literature specifically about the picnic. I hope those of you come who are here can come. There's a swimming pool, a campfire. It's a wonderful set, uh, setting in, um, in Montgomery County, a, a single family house in Montgomery County. Um, so I wanna ask, first of all, in terms of today's session, um, we've had maybe seven or eight people volunteer to talk for five minutes. I don't know where my list is. Ah, um, has anybody, would anybody want to do the five minute talk about some scriptural passage who has not already volunteered? One, two, okay. All right. Um, so I think we can go for maybe five and a half. I think we can afford six minutes. I will tell you to stop. I, I was going to say, if if you can keep it to five, great. If if you're if you're at five and a half, I will give you a thirty second warning. I have a stopwatch. Um, and um, but first, um, we wanted to introduce this topic, which is basically our love for holy books. I have been around as as, as the, the 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 head of the Washington Spinoza Society. I'm certainly familiar with many folks who want no part of religion. Right. And I've been around communities that are not tied to the holy books. And it, I've noticed, shall we say, a lack. Um, there is something we get from the holy books. And I wanted somebody to give a talk about the importance of the holy books. And Mike seems like a wonderful choice. Um, I don't know how many of you know Mike. Um, he's written a book on the Quran, which I have read and really enjoyed. He is the head of this organization. Um, for pluralism, uh, the plur the plural Center for Pluralism, which brings together, you know, scholarship um, on various faiths, not just Abrahamic, numerous faiths, um, really a, a prophet uh, for plur pluralism. And I think maybe most relevantly for today, um, a little story about Mike. Um, so he was on Sean Hannity a lot. Uh, he was the token Muslim for a long period of time. Um, and you know how, how Hannity likes to have somebody that he can, he can beat on, right? So I guess Mike served that role at some point about Islam. And at some point, um, Sean Hannity said, you know, um, you convinced me to stop bashing the Quran. I may have a problem with this Muslim or that Muslim or this group or that group, but at least I'm gonna cleanse my tongue and not insult the Quran. So um, we all thank you for that. And you're being timed too, my friend. I need this. I need this. Oh, okay. He gets many more minutes than the rest of us. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Peace. Shalom. Namaste and whichever way I can greet, all the greetings mean the same. May God shower his peace on all of us. And that's what salam and shalom means. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, okay. Rabbi Gordis had said, dialogue is when it is not a monologue. You have to respect the otherness of other, give the equal value for the other person to have a dialogue. If you are the only one 
assuming the other person doesn't know you have to teach them, then it is not a dialogue. I'm so glad to be a part of JIT society. And Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Islam is not a new religion. It is the same tradition brought in by Abraham, followed by Moses, Jesus, and wrapped up by Muhammad. You will see, I will be sharing some of my favorite verses from all these scriptures. You will see that the values are same in all religions. We may worship differently, we may bow differently, but the values are identical as I share that with you. As someone who upholds pluralistic ideals and respects the beliefs and identities of others as equal, I aim to present the following topic, inclusivity. First, let's consider the concept of God. For many, God is not a physical being, but an energy that brought the universe into existence. While some believe that God manifests in human nature, human form, the very fact of existence of life encourages us to live in harmony with each other. The intricate balance in the universe from the rotation of the planets to the cycles of day and night and earth supports life as we know it. Whether we are caused, evolved, emerged from the Big Bang or created, the fact of the matter is we exist and we have to live in peace with each other, feel secure with each other. Whatever caused the universe, it was created in balance and harmony, all of it. Look at the planets circum, I cannot pronounce this word right, circumambulating, going around. I have difficulty pronouncing that word. Anyway, uh, they're going very precise angles. If they go by half a degree, the world can collapse and we may not be here to talk about anything. We won't be there. Let's also come down from the solar system down to the earth. The earth rotates very precisely, very perfectly. And it tilts at a certain angles to give us day, night and different seasons so life can continue to survive. Many people ascribe many attributes to this divine energy, such as compassion, justice, and transcendence. Okay, someone, some profound energy created the physical aspect of the universe to function in harmony, the physical aspect. Some anomaly is always built in. However, humans were not programmed to function in harmony. They were given, they were endowed with the free will to act freely. And it is the free will that causes problems in the world. It creates peace as well as it creates wars and conflicts. Once again, God, the cause, created the universe and let it run on autopilot. He does not intervene and let us figure out how to live securely in peace. He does not mess with us. He just created things in autopilot. You take care of it. Remember, there is an illusive moment of reckoning at the day of judgment in all the faiths, in all the traditions that rewards us with eternal peace or tension forever. Eternal peace is defined as paradise and the other one, something else. However, no one goes on a limb. He guides us through books, oral traditions, prophets, avatars, and peacemakers. And that is the theme of our topic, holy books. And here is where the concept of God love, God's love appears in our minds. Most people share similar attributes for things, energy, compassionate, just, omniscient, omnipresent, glorious, genderless, and many, many names. Muslims have ascribed 99 names to God. 99 is not the finite number, it is an infinite number to express God in different attributes. In Hinduism, there are 1,000 names of God. They're not limited. Means these are the different attributes. We cannot limit God. 
I like the way the Jewish people write G hyphen D means you cannot limit God to anything. So that no religion limits God. Each of us calls this causer by many names, the causer of the universe. Abraham called him Jehovah. Moses called him Yahweh. Jesus called him Elihi. And he is a Palestinian here. He knows that the pastor, Elihi. Uh, Prophet Muhammad called him Allah. Hindus call him by many names such as Ishwar, Brahman, or Bhagwan. The Baha'is call him Baha, means the glorious. And the Zoroastrians call Ahura Mazda. And the Sikhs call him Waheguru. Being a pluralist, I cannot exclude any religion. I have to speak about all religions. What makes this causer of the universe so full of love? What makes God so full of love? Love is part of creation. Like a mother loves her offspring. An inventor loves his product. A software programmer loves his program. A surgeon wants his patients to heal. A teacher loves her students. And a chef loves his patrons who appreciate his food. And importantly for today, Dan loves his jets. <laughs> and of course we do too. And that is why we see JITS and the Center for Pluralism offer many educational and controversial programs for us to be knowledgeable about different things that bring us interactions. Jesus said on the cross, forgive him, Lord, for they know not. And it is our duty, those who know, to share with those who know not. And that is part of what JITS does. All of them want, these engineers, doctors, teachers, mothers, all of them want their product or creation to function well. This is their love or their product. God is no different. God loves his creation. And that is his love. He wants us to live in peace and harmony. And God's words are not exclusive. They're inclusive. They're universal. Many of our clergy have reduced God's words to be exclusive as if they own that particular God. There is no particular God. There is a common God for all of us. You can see the title of the topic, today's topic emerge now. Our love for our holy books. God guides when somebody loves you as a mother loves you, teacher loves you. God gives us He's not going to leave us alone. He guides us. He gives us free will, but he also guides us to walk the right path, the path of those who earned his grace. And also those path that gives us all security and peace to all of us. God is not a being, once again, is not a thing. It is an energy that has runs on an autopilot. The ultimate goal of all of us Every one of us is security and peace. Some of my favorite verses come to my mind from different sources. I will share some. Due to the time limit, I couldn't share more verses. Lord Krishna, the Hindu representation of God in the Bhagavad Gita, that is their holy book, says that whenever the society crumbles and when people don't trust each other, it creates chaos. Then he said he will emerge, emerge from among them to restore dharma or the righteousness so people can live in peace and harmony again. The Quran says that God has sent a messenger, a peacemaker to every nation, every tribe, every community. Because God loves all of us, his creation, he wants every community to live in peace. So there is a peacemaker for every group to create peace for them. Isn't that true? Same thing about Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Krishna, Buddha, Mahavir, Guru Nanak, Zarathustra, Baha'u'llah, and Joseph Smith. They all came to restore security and peace to the groups that belonged. And I love the Jewish phrase, Tikkun Olam, and also the Islamic phrase, Islahul Alam. 
our scholar Safi is here. Islam is alam is a word I created. Uh, means repairing the world. It is our duty to repair the world so that you, me, and each one of us can live securely. Another words, I like that we all came from Adam and Eve as in all the Abrahamic traditions. And Hinduism calls it Vasudeva Kutumukum. That is the entire world is one family. When we are all one family, we have to care about each other and feel the pain if somebody's having pain in Philippines or Canada or Brazil, we should feel the pain. If you don't feel the pain, there is something less about us. I love this when Jesus answered, I am the way, truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let me share my understanding. Jesus walked the righteous path of justice, caring and giving dignity to every soul. Whether it is a leper or a prostitute, he embraced them. That is the, what Jesus wants us to walk the path of respecting and accepting all humanity. And that is my understanding. If you differ, I'm okay with it. We all believe in a common God, the God of the universe and God of all of us. There is only one causer of the universe. We must treat all religions as guidance for humanity to live in peace and harmony with what surrounds us. To believe that my religion is superior, to believe that my religion is superior means I have not understood the purpose of religion. I'll share a small story. In a speech about 10 years ago, I said, I chose Islam to be my faith, but I will never claim my religion to be superior to any other religion. That all hell broke loose. Two of my imams in Dallas, Texas called me on the carpet and said, how can you choose Islam and not believe your religion is superior? And I said, before I answer you, Imam, I want you to answer me this question. From the Quran, not from what you believe, from the Quran, who God loves the most and the least. He said, God loves the most those who forgive and forgive often. So fine, perfect. What about the least? He says, those who are arrogant. And I said, there you go. If I claim my religion is superior, I'm arrogant. Religion is not about arrogance. Arrogance kills relationship, creates problems. Humility builds bridges. Religion is about humility. And that's what Jesus did when he washed the feet. Okay. Once, likewise, when the Torah says the Jews were chosen people are the ideals of promised land. What Rabbi Jerry Sarato said to me in one of the seminars we held in the Capitol Hill, God chose people, Jews, to bring righteousness to the world, to bring social justice. That's what it meant to him, and that's what I believe it would mean. And each person may disagree with that. Prophet Muhammad defined an excellent deed or a good deed as something you do for others. If you plant, if you sapling or a seed, when the tree grows and gives you the shade or the fruit, you are not the beneficiary. You know that. Someone else is, some stranger is beneficiary. He calls that a good deed. Almost all traditions believe that God judges you by the number of good deeds you do, good things you do for others. And good deeds are what you do for others without any gain. And this time I would like to admire all the volunteers here and around us, let's give them a big round of applause for the selfless service they provide, please. All right. Here is another one. I'll finish it in one minute. Another verse from the Quran, which asked Prophet Muhammad to tell the people, we believe in Allah. And what has been revealed to us to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and descendants, and Moses, Jesus, 
in what other prophets received from their Lord. This is the Quran saying, we make no distinction between them. They're all submitters of God. Imagine if God had said, Muhammad is the greatest prophet on the earth, Muslims would have been very arrogant. But God said, Muhammad said, all of us are equal. That is to shed, kill the arrogance in humanity. Uh, just a few more seconds. In spirit of universality and collective understanding, it is vital to embrace, embrace the idea that we are all connected as a single human family, regardless of our religious affiliations. Ultimately, unity is the key to recognizing the omnipresent. The bottom line is to create societies. That is the purpose of all religions and all the prophets that came to create societies where each of us feels secure and peace and harmony with each other. Thank you, Dan. As you guys can tell, I'm pretty literal when I say a number of minutes, but I, I will say that the question was asked, what is JIDS? Maybe the best thing I can say about this organization to, to really tell you our, our nature. Uh, one time um, we did a very Washington DC thing. We asked people to, um, when the speakers were finished, um, take slips of paper, we gave them slips and they would put in their questions. Like you've all seen that, right? Where you, you write the questions, if you have any questions down. And then when we got it, we, we got the questions and ripped them up and said, this is not a speaker's bureau. This is a dialogue society. You don't have to ask questions. If you have something to say, you say it. So that's why I'm trying to keep the trains on track so that as many of your voices can be heard as possible. Um, okay, um, so we have some like eight talks. Very briefly, we won't have time for people to respond after each talk because we're gonna have Q, um, maybe some Q&A, but definitely small groups at the end. So, um, Reverend, do you wanna start? Um, sure. Yeah. I, one, I can set the pace yeah. for less than oh. Wow. <laughs> so, all right. I tough run it though. <laughs> yeah. um, so the question was, what's my favorite Bible passage? And, uh, and just say a few words about it. So um, there's a lot to pick from, but for me, I think the one that uh, means the most right now is um, from Luke chapter six, Jesus says, I say to you, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. Uh, and the reason that I love this verse is because it's it really stands out as a very Jesus theology type thing. Um, and, uh, and the context for me is when you think of that kind of message, you go, that's really goes over and beyond um, like generosity. Most people are like, be generous to your neighbor and, you know, do good to someone whom you like. But this is like, this is a step beyond that to love your enemy, to pray for those who abuse you. It, it's like you would call it radical. It's not just generosity. It's radical generosity, like emotional generosity. I don't know many of us who would feel comfortable doing that truly blessing those who curse us. And uh, and the reason I think this is so profound is that if you look at all of Jesus's teachings, they all have this radical generosity piece to it. Uh, and, and you have to ask the question, why? Why is it why is it not just generosity? Why is it radical generosity? And I, I think that the answer to that for me is that if you look at the source of all the human inflicted suffering in our world, if you look at it, the source is actually taking, right? Taking life, taking land, taking or denying freedom, taking dignity. You think about stripping the earth of its resources, hoarding wealth, taking revenge, and on and on. So taking seems to be the, the problem at the center of, of human suffering. And that Jesus saw the antidote to that is radical giving. So Jesus says things like, if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, again, take, give your cloak as well. It like breaks the cycle of that taking. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, give him your left cheek. Give mercy as your father in heaven gives mercy. Give forgiveness. Forgive as you've been forgiven. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. 
just as I have loved you, so you also should give love. So I think that that, for me, radical generosity isn't just a nice thing that we're supposed to do. It actually is the antidote to the, the real problem in our world, which is the taking. Thank you. So. Thank you very much. Wow. No, it was great. I mean, in terms of content or time, content is, is less important. No, I'm kidding. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, okay, Martha, would you like to go next? You warned me. I got my watch here. Okay. I actually uh, won't do that. By the way, if you want to say something nice about the church, I won't time that. Okay, this is a beautiful church. Thank you for letting me be here. Seriously, I, I am really glad to be here. This is my, I think, third time with Jid, so it's kind of what we call where I come from, chutzpah dick. But I want, I love the opportunity to talk about my two favorite characters in all the Hebrew Bible, Shifra and Pua, the midwives. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some other things in Exodus, the early chapters of Exodus. But to set the stage, we know that at the end of Genesis, Joseph brought his large extended family to Egypt to avoid a famine. Pharaoh let them stay in the land of Goshen, and uh, they grew and they prospered. And we start with Exodus, and there is a new pharaoh who is very fearful that um, that this extended family is turning into a fifth column, and he implements to a plan to keep the Hebrew people from reproducing by requiring that the firstborn male be killed. Uh, Shifra and Pua, the midwives, did not like this idea, and he tells them uh, that when they get to see the Hebrew women, by the time that they, they get there, the women have already delivered because they're just, they're so lively is how the translation goes. They're vigorous. So they've already given birth. And I was so excited when I read this because it's, I love midwives. I used to be a nurse um, because they're standing up to raw power. To me, Pharaoh, um, symbolizes real egotism, egomania. And these women don't allow the power of the egomaniacal pharaoh to destroy the lives of new beings. They recognize that each new being is a light in the world who deserves to live. Now, because of the grammatical construction, miladot ha'ivrit, we aren't sure if Shifra and Pua are Hebrews themselves or midwives to the Hebrews. So just hold that thought for like two minutes. So while the Torah, the Hebrew Bible tells us that God protected the midwives from Pharaoh's wrath, Pharaoh went ahead and did what dictators do. He enlisted the people as spies and commanded that they throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River. Now in chapter two, we meet Moses's mother and she gave birth during this time, kept Moses at home for three months, and then she couldn't hide him anymore. So she puts him in a basket and lets him float in the river and sends her daughter Miriam out to see what would happen. Now Baya, Batya makes her entrance, and Batya means um, daughter of God in Hebrew. So this wasn't her real name. We don't know what it is. She's a daughter of Pharaoh. And she's bathing with her maidens in the Nile. She sees the basket in the weeds. And when she opened it, she sees this little baby boy crying. And she took pity on it and said, this must be a Hebrew child. So instead of tossing the baby back into the river, she sends the little girl, who is Miriam, Moses' older sister, to fetch a wet nurse. And this wet nurse just happens to be Moses' mother. So let's take a look at the women in this story. We have two midwives who may or may not be Hebrews. Pharaoh's daughter, who is definitely not a Hebrew, and the Hebrew mother and sister of Moses. Each of them knew that a baby's life is more precious than the command of an egomaniacal king. Whether they were followers of the God of the Hebrews or not, 
they listened to an inner command. The midwives stood together. And Batya, Miriam, and Moses' mother all stood together. Their inner power became outer power. So before finishing, I want to say a few words about this inner command using the third chapter in Exodus as my text. So now we fast forward and the adult Moses is tending his father-in-law's flocks in Midian, where he comes upon a bush that is burning but not being consumed in its own flames. He hears a voice and it is God's voice. And he's telling Moses, or God, I don't like to say he, God is telling Moses to go to Pharaoh in order to liberate the enslaved Hebrew people. Moses says to God, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is this God's name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, Ehie, Asher, Ehie. God continued, thus shall you say to the Israelites, Yahweh, Yudhe Wavhe, sent me to you. This shall be my name forever for all eternity. A simple translation of ehie, asher ehie, is I will be what I will be. Now I personally, and I certainly won't do this in front of theologians here, say if God is always evolving, but our understanding of God evolves. And because of that, our actions can evolve. How do we know what we are called to do? How did the midwives know? Why did Batya defy her father, who was also her pharaoh? So before finishing, I want to talk about the second name, Yudhe Wavhe, which is translated in, in my version of the Hebrew Bible as the eternal. Commentators, commentators have pointed out that this is an impossible grammatical construction of is, was, will be, that can really only be pronounced as our breath, like a, a whoosh. The breath is what some see as the spirit of God breathed into each of us. Many meditate to become close to this breath of spirit. I've been meditating a number of years and I have come to the conclusion that it is not possible and probably not desirable to lead an egoless life. Yet I will posit that the early part of our story shows us that it is possible to turn from a life of ego aggrandizement, um, kind of like what the previous speaker spoke of when we take, this is when the ego runs amok and it is deadly, to one that recognizes the life-giving breath and that and that creates the calling to honor this breath above all else, which is what our midwives did in the beginning of the story. Okay, thank you so, so much. Let's keep this going. Safi Kaskas. I like to greet you the way Moses learned to greet his people, Shalom Aleichem, and the way Jesus learned to greet his disciples, Shalom Aleichem, that's in Aramaic, and the way Muhammad uh, learned to treat to greet his people, Assalamu Aleichem. All three greetings have one thing in common. Establish peace. Deal with others in a peaceful way. My name is Safi Kaskas. I'm very fortunate to know this young man and uh, happy to see you and to meet you today. <clears throat> Our gathering is a testament to the power of understanding and sharing universal values that transcend religious boundaries and religious conflicts. Today, I would like to share a verse from the Quran that beautifully encapsulates the essence of divine guidance. 
and the relationship between different faith. The verse I have chosen is from Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is the fifth chapter of the Quran, verse 48. Let me recite the verse for you. I will start in Arabic, followed by English. <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لكل جعلنا منكم شرعة ومنهاجا ولو شاء الله لجعلكم أمة واحدة ولكن ليبلوكم فيما آتاكم فاستبقوا الخيرات إلى الله مرجعكم جميعا فينبئكم بما كنتم فيه تختلفون To each of you we have a sign, a law, and a way of life. If God had wanted, he could have made you a single community. But instead, he is testing you using what he has revealed to you. So be forward and compete with all that is good. You will all return to God. And he will clarify the matters about which you have differed. This verse begins by acknowledging that God has assigned different laws and ways of life to various communities. This diversity is intentional and serves a greater purpose. It reflects the richness of a human experience and the different path through which people can seek and understand the divine. The verse continues by explaining that if God had willed, he could have made all of the humanity a single community. However, he chose to create diversity as a test for us. This test is not about rivalry, but about how we respond to the guidance provided to us. It challenges us to follow our respective path with sincerity and integrity. It brings to mind Matthew 22, 37, 39 and beyond, a discussion between a Jewish law student and Jesus. The law students asked Jesus about the greatest commandment. Jesus replied, Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor like yourself. But the law student desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, But how? who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, with the parable of the good Palestinian, not good Palestinian, good Samaritan. One of the most profound messages of this verse is the call to be forward with all that is good. In other words, we need to compete with each other, to serve each other, to show the best we have and put it forward. Encouraged to compete, serving each other, and to actively seek and perform good deeds. This principle of striving for goodness is a common thread that unites all faith and moral system. Do I have some more? Good. <laughs> That's five minutes. <laughs> I, I tamed it. Thank you. Return to God. The verse concludes with a reminder that ultimately we will all return to God. We will clarify the matters about which God will clarify the matters about which we differ. It has respect of diversity. The verse beautifully encapsulates the universe, universal value of respective diversity. It acknowledges that different communities have different laws and different ways of life. And this diversity is part of God's plan. By respecting this diversity, we can foster a more inclusive and harmonious world. The verse also promotes interfaith harmony by recognizing the validity of different paths and encouraging 
mutual respect and understanding. It reminds us that our differences are not a barrier, but an opportunity to learn from one another and grow together. The values highlighted in this verse can also be extended to create a compassionate and supportive community and society. By striving for goodness and respecting diversity, we can work together to address common challenges to build a better future for all. I encourage each of you to reflect on your own experience and consider how you can apply these values in your relationship and interactions. How can we as individuals and communities strive for goodness and respect the diversity that enriches our world? In summary, Quran 548 teaches us about the intentional diversity of laws and ways of life assigned by God. It calls us to strive for goodness, respect our differences, and recognize our shared destiny of returning to God, who will clarify our differences. Con conclusion. As we conclude, let us carry forward the message of this verse in our hearts and actions. Let us embrace the values of respect, understanding, and striving for goodness in our daily lives. By doing so, we can contribute to a more harmonious and compassionate world. Thank you. My only supplement as a native of this country is to use the word compete, competing for goodness. You don't, that, that's not a concept that you read about in our economics books, um, but it's maybe the essence of what he said, what he just said. Okay, um, Pastor Newhart. Good afternoon. Would like to give a um, perspective on John. Excuse me. <clears throat> Would like to give a, um, a perspective on John one, chapter one, verses one to five, and then jumping down to uh, verse fourteen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And then down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. What I like about this particular passage first is the poetry of it. You know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Indeed, I remember in my um, in in my class we used to sing this uh, this in Greek uh, to a modern hymn tune. So I, I really like the poetry, and also I'm appreciative of the poetry of, of many scriptures, because it seems that poetry often speaks uh, our depths better than, better than prose does. Another reason that I appreciate this particular passage is because it, it, it seems to give a Christian interpretation of Genesis. You know, so that the beginning was the word. And so just as Genesis speaks about speaks about God speaking the word and speaking the world into existence, so here John speaks about the word being present and the word being that of God which reaches out to to others, to the not God. 
and then you know i've i've liked this passage for a long time really m much of my life you know because it presents this idea of incarnation that is that the word became flesh you know the, you know or god became uh, a human being and it speaks of the the incarnation in uh, terms from the Hebrew Bible. That is that, you know, that we have seen his glory and that was full of grace and truth. And so Christians speak about the incarnation in Jesus of Nazareth and that he lived and taught the truth that we are to follow. Now, some of my more conservative brethren, uh, brothers and sisters, will talk about how it is God's exclusive love, which was manifested in Jesus. And in order to uh, receive eternal life or depth of life, then one must be committed to this person. I choose to look at it in terms of in this person, called Jesus of Nazareth from the first century, you know, certainly he lived, he, he lived the life of love, he incarnated that, and so we can follow that particular path. It is not an exclusive path, indeed it is a universal path, so that as we follow our highest ideals as set forth by, you know, our leaders, our prophets, our our priests, our spiritual leaders, then we will experience that life, that depth of life among people, and also that life which is extended uh, beyond. So, you know, I, you know, I am rooting myself in this particular uh, passage, and indeed, you know, I join with others who who uh, follow. Christ, but also join with others who follow uh, various traditions, uh, various uh, spiritual ideals, so that we can, so that we can plant seeds of justice, of peace, of love among all peoples. Thank you. Thank you. Is Hannah Gould here? Okay. Dennis Scotch. Okay. Well, <clears throat> good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the uh, faith community here at St. John's for setting up this wonderful event from which I think we'll all uh, very much benefit from. <clears throat> Uh, my reading comes from John. I don't know if that's it, 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 uh, John's epistle, first epistle. And uh, I think he did bookends of what I'm going to do. Um, is that the namesake? Is he the namesake of this community, St. John's? Uh, oh, it is. Okay. Well chosen. Um, I'm going to do a... Uh, 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 a, a rather lengthy uh, reading from this with accenting and slight footnoting. But if I use most of my five minutes doing that, that will be better than you're hearing my extensive uh, <clears throat> philosophically oriented uh, uh, footnotes on this. Okay. Um, beloved, let us love one another because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows, knows God, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> in this love, not that we, uh, in, in this, oh, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as expiation for our sins. Okay. So two way thing, love, okay. Then we go to, beloved, if God has loved us, we must love one another. God remains in us 
and his love is brought uh, brought to perfection in us. So if God is love and his perfection and, and love's perfection is uh, brought in our love. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. So <clears throat> let me read that again. Uh, beloved, if God so loved us, we must love one another. Okay, okay. Then, then I went to. <clears throat> no one has ever seen God. Yet, if we love one another, God remains in us, and His love is brought to perfection in us. If He's love. And he's brought to perfection by the love that we do. Well, does that mean? Well, okay. I'll, I'll just leave leave you to think about that. We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God, and God in Him. Okay. Uh, this this has always provoked a lot of thought in me, and and I think we were asked to say how, wh why is this so meaningful to us as a I will say believer, but I, I think I like the word person of faith rather than believer. <clears throat> and see why in a minute. Um, first of all, I, I I get a diagram here which has a vertical axis and horizontal axis. And the vertical axis talks about the relationship between God and us human beings. The horizontal axis talks about the relationship be among human beings themselves. And these two things go together. They go together in a community of love. Okay. Which echoes, which echoes something that was quoted earlier, the two great commandments, love God with your whole heart and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. This, this passage, by putting us all together in one being, that being called God, called love, you see, is what comes out of this. A community. God is a community. God is a family. It is, And it's not determined by <clears throat> a creed. It's not determined by a, a, a philosophy. It's, it's not something that uh, I, as a credential philosopher, might do apart from any of these readings. Um, and uh, it uh, it is also it is also a kind of ethic. There is a must in this relationship that we have uh, among each other. What else? I I was struck by the expression that <clears throat> uh, it says that uh, it, it this this thing called love. I'm I'm not really talking here. John says I'm not really talking here. The Lord says. I'm not really talking about your love for God. You're, I'm talking about his love for you. So there's kind of an asymmetry there. There's a kind of asymmetry there. And uh, that I think is to be thought about. And uh, I guess I guess what fascinates me as a credentialed philosopher is, is not the ability of philosophy on its own to come up with something like this, but to look at this and think about what it means. Not to prove this creedal uh, belief or that, but to tell us something about what it says. And I, I see here something we philosophers would call a theory of being, an ontology, uh, uh, an understanding of being. And, and it says, I think, Dan, you'll appreciate this. It says that we are part of a divine being, and that being is named by love. God is not spoken of as a power, nor even as a creator. All of these things would have to be related to the name for who God, what, who God is, and that is love. A love that's greater than, for us, than any love that we can uh, give to him. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, before hearing from the two more volunteers for today, I'll, I'll call my own number now. My favorite verse in the Hebrew Bible is one that Jews read every year on Rosh Hashanah. 
Samuel 1, chapter 1, begins with a reference to a man who had two wives, Penina, who gave him children, and Hannah, who did not. Cruelly taunted by her rival that God had closed her womb, Hannah greatly suffered from that fact. And so we get to verse 11, Hannah's prayer. O Lord of hosts, if you would look upon the suffering of your maidservant and will remember me and not forget your maidservant, and if you will grant your, male ser your maidservant a male child, I will dedicate him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. This verse begins with perhaps the quintessential activity of the Jewish faith, a lone individual turning to God. Hannah addressed her God as the Lord of hosts. This name refers to the heavenly hosts or armies of angels God commands. Its use highlights the infinite distance between the Jewish God's greatness and human power. Hannah is praying to a God whose scope and power is beyond our imagination, not only because of God's infinitude, but because of human frailty and weakness. To worship the awesome, majestic Jewish God is the height of humility. In this verse, Hannah thrice refers to herself as your maidservant. She wants to see God, she wants God to see her, as one who is willing to do the work that is dirty and unglamorous, yet critical. Because she needs God to answer her prayer, Hannah's first order of business is to persuade God that she can be depended on. And the maidservant's role is the one that fits that bill. Hannah is reminding us that the Jew's highest vocation is not to bring status to oneself, but simply to lend a hand. It's a similar lesson that Jesus taught in the book of Luke when he suggested that it is better to sit at the table than it is to serve, but he has come among us as one who serves. Now that we know the two characters, God and Hannah, let's look at what Hannah had in mind for their relationship. She wants to engage in another fundamentally Jewish activity entering into a covenant. Jews must be willing to make and honor commitments, even to God. Commitments are the foundations of our economies, our families, and our self-respect. You want to know what a mensch is? Someone who honors their commitments. When we read Hannah's prayer, we're convinced that she could never dishonor her promise. Here, the promise was, if she were to have a baby, she'd give that little child away to the local priest who would raise him. Now let's look at the miracle that Hannah seeks, the miracle of a human life. It's hard to exaggerate the importance that Jewish parents place on the lives of our children. And Hannah wanted a child in the worst way. Yet she prayed for the right to deny herself the opportunity to watch her child grow up. There is no act of giving that moves me more than Hannah's decision to give away her young child that her heart so desired. This is the part that always makes me cry. Hannah's child knows is came to be known ultimately as the prophet Samuel. Despite being a figure who spoke truth to power, it is written that when Samuel died, all of Israel gathered and made lament for him. So two Jews, three opinions, but not about Samuel. In terms of Jewish heroes, the wise and courageous Samuel was our bridge between Moses and his contemporaries and David and Solomon. Famously, the bard told us that some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon us. Well, Samuel was clearly born great. His greatness sprang from his mother's faith and integrity and on the figure to whom she dedicated his life. 
You see, for me, the key phrase in this magnificent verse is, quote, I will dedicate him to the Lord for all the days of his life. We hear so much in Judaism about God, especially in our prayer services. But in that sentence, God's name is invoked in the best possible way. Hannah is saying that if God will create a new human being through her, she will see to it that this person will treat God in every waking moment, not as a benefactor, but as a beneficiary. For he will be God's truest servant. This human being will always find a way to, to find in God a guide, a guide to lead him to the heights of moral excellence. He will honor God. He will do right by God. He will act virtuously in God's name to produce the greatest good for the greatest number. That's what it means to be dedicated to God from the womb to the tomb. It has nothing to do with asking God for favors. Hannah got that out of her system in verse 11. She would no longer ask God for help. She would give us Samuel to help, to use all his powers to enrich the earth, which is the best way to honor God. That, to me, is what the Jewish faith is all about. And I should add that when my wife and I had our first child, we named the child Hannah. And she serves as the rabbi in Capitol Hill for the community there. Thankfully, our views on gender issues have evolved since the days of the biblical Hannah. Um, sir, can you come and, and come next? Yes, yes. You yield your time. So we have one more volunteer over here. OK, please. Practice this. I mean, don't mess around with that. That's called honoring commitments. No, it is. It's, it's a fundamental Jewish value. That's when I think of what a mensch is. When someone says they're going to do something, they do it. You can count on it. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Salam alaikum. My name is Dana Winner. It means a lot to me to be with you today and special thanks to Dr. Safi for inviting me and make me aware. I've been back in US after 24 years in the Middle East and just re reconnecting, but connecting in new ways as well. I was saying to Daniel that I was there at the beginning of Hill Havara and uh, then went back to the Middle East for the third time. 24 years ago, tomorrow, by coincidence, I was sitting on my back porch, looking at my beautiful garden, enjoying my beautiful townhouse on Capitol Hill, thinking about my wonderful work life and the many opportunities and at the same time, thinking about yet another invitation to return back to the Middle East. And I needed guidance. And here's the guidance that I received. And I'm sure I must have read this some other time because I've read the Bible cover to cover straight through and studied it thoroughly since uh, before I was born, you could say, from my mother's womb, born in Corpus Christi, Texas, so. But I had never paid attention to it. Isaiah 19, 23 through 25, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, the Assyrians will go to Egypt <laughs> and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty 
will bless them saying, blessed be Egypt, my people. Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Thank you so much for sharing. And we have one more person. Um, my old friend from a, the peace movement from a, a zillion years ago. Uh, Jim, it's yours. Okay, so hi, my name is Jim Vitarello. I'm a little uh, background reference. I'm an Italian American Christian. You hear me? You hear me? Yeah, I'm an Italian American Christian with a very strange Christian Judeo background. Um, I grew up like most Italians as a Catholic. Um, my mother was a very devout Catholic. She was actually from Italy. Uh, and um, during law school, I converted to uh, Methodism um, for a whole variety of reasons I won't go into now. And during college, I joined a progressive Jewish fraternity known as Sigma Alpha Mu. If you're Jewish, you're a male, you probably know who they are, otherwise affectionately known as Sammies. They were by far and away the most progressive fraternity on campus. We actually had, in 1962, we had African-Americans there, um, including a very, very, um, excuse me? Thank you. you can't, you can't, you didn't hear, hear me? Yeah, um, yeah, we had, we had two African-Americans in 1962 when no other, no other uh, fraternity uh, would do that. And by the way, there was a very conservative um, the Jewish fraternity on campus known as A.E. Pi. Uh, I affectionately call them the Jewish settlers. Um, and, and they acted like it. But again, we won't go in, into all that. And now today I'm an Episcopalian because my children all went to the Washington Cathedral uh, schools. And my wife, who was um, raised ba Southern Baptist, in fact, her father was a Southern Baptist chaplain in the Navy, um, wanted to join the cathedral when they actually created a congregation for the first time in their history about 12 or 13 years ago. So now I, I go to, to the cathedral. So that's just by way of background. I also want to thank my old friend Dan for um, creating JIDS. I always thought it was a great um, idea to do this. Uh, and I admire him a lot for doing that. And and I'm really glad that uh, Christians are now allowed uh, to join as well. It's in our mission it's statement. It says allies. <laughs> and particularly in this church, which I know extremely well. I know, I know, um, sorry, very well. I know his father, Naim Atik, a great uh, Palestinian Christian uh, minister from Jerusalem. So I, too, am talking like Safi did about um, um, the... Uh, uh, the, the commandment by Jesus to love um, uh, your your um, your neighbor as yourself. I'm going to have a little slightly twist to it. You'll see near at the end why. But um, I'll sort of skip some of the things that that you already mentioned. In fact, I even quoted um, the same chapter of Matthew, etc. Um, but I think it's important, particularly for those of you who may not know too much about the Christian religion is that there are actually four Gospels in, in Christianity uh, named after uh, four of the, um, um, I might add, Jewish disciples of Jesus, because, of course, Jesus himself was also Jewish, but all 12 of the disciples of Jesus, um, Matthew, Mark, um, Luke, and John. But in three of those, Matthew, Luke, and John, uh, they specifically mention love thy neighbor, but again, different ways, but they're basically the same message. I think that's extremely important because Jesus himself said in each of those three Gospels, loving God and loving your neighbors are the two most important fundamental teachings of Christianity. I want to emphasize that because many of my brethren Christians to the right of me, 
Now, I hate to say this, but I, I need to say this today, and I know many of them. Rarely, if ever, have I ever heard them talk about loving your neighbor. I'm talking about ministers, I'm talking about political leaders, etc. And again, I know many, many evangelicals. I like them very much. But for some reason, they shy away from this. And just think about that, just for um, a little thought. So again, I'm going to skip several of the things that uh, were already mentioned, um, and including the, the Gospel of John, which, oh, oh yes, there is one thing in the Gospel of John that the Savi didn't mention that's, I think, very important. Jesus said, if you love those, oh, by the, this is after mm, asking the, um, the scribe, uh, the Jewish scribe, um, who asked him, who is my neighbor, right? Jesus said to him, if you love those who love you, what I see. I don't have my uh, my glasses on. What reward will you get? Are not even the tax collector collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do this. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So now in conclusion, I'm going to read a, a short <clears throat> passage from uh, a group I belong to. I, 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 I donate to them monthly. Um, <clears throat> it's called the National Shrine of St. Jude. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. Um, but St. Jude was a remarkable, again, one of the 12 disciples of, of Jesus for several reasons. One, he was actually a cousin of Jesus. Uh, two, he was certainly a disciple. But three, later on in 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 life, uh, in not not his life, but in in world and human life, uh, many centuries after he died, he became known as the patron saint of hope for lost causes. <clears throat> The world-renowned St. Jude's Children's Hospital, of course, is named after him. I don't know if you know it or not, but the, the then famous Danny Thomas, a uh, <clears throat> Lebanese-American Christian entertainer and comedian who I actually got to know when I was attending the University of Toledo because he and his Lebanese Christian friends lived in Toledo. And my progressive Jewish fraternity actually helped him raise some of the earliest funds for St. Jude's before it even became a hospital. Am I running low on time? Okay. So, so, what, I, so what I want to uh, quote then is um, a passage from uh, the National Shrine, which they sent me. They call it Faith Reflections. And I, and I really love it because it it gives a whole different uh, twist to love thy neighbor. And this is a quote. If only all the world in all of history could have followed that most important, simplest, yet clearly most difficult of commands, love thy neighbor. What sorrow and anguish could have been avoided? That's a remarkable statement, and I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Oh, I never can make some copies of my presentation for everyone. Well, I'm passing around small groups of questions. We're going to go right to that. Um, maybe you can, uh, I know some of you told me, and it's more dirty and some more. Thank you. 
So everybody, um, you should have four questions. I would advise you to find somebody who could sort of moderate each of the discussions, but um, let's see if we can at least take 45 minutes to do this. Cause... 